Welcome, everyone. I want to make sure everybody had a chance to find your seat um, wherever you're at. Um, we're so glad to have everybody here. Welcome to Global Entrepreneurship Week. This is the State of the Union. Global Entrepreneurship, I can't even say the word. Global Entrepreneurship Week is brought to you by Western Health Advantage and through the um, collaboration with uh, all of us here in the region, including the Carlson Center. I cannot tell you how excited I am. I, was, I have been for this week. It's been so great to see all the work come together that not only the, the team at the Carlson Center has, has put together, but also the greater Sacramento ecosystem. It's been amazing to watch it all come together and to see all the great programming for this week. I hope you enjoy it and are able to log on into as many of the different events as possible. When my wife and I made our, our donation, it was our hope that this center would be the hub um, that helped accelerate the innovation and entrepreneurial culture in our region. And working with President Nelson, we wanted an interdisciplinary hub that spanned across all the colleges at Sac State, as well as the greater Sacramento entrepreneurial ecosystem. And we are so proud of the work that Cameron, Jesse, Brian, and Arlene have done to create not just a building where stakeholders could come, but thank goodness with COVID and all, they've also been able to create a place where virtually people can go that can create and foster a culture where all are welcome um, and really inviting for everybody to be part of no matter where everybody is, out, is at, including the students in the community and the, and the community at large a true hub for innovation and entrepreneurialism for our region stakeholders. I'm so impressed with the pivot this team has done due to COVID, creating virtual programs that not only provide an on-ramp for those interested in entrepreneurship, such as the Entrepreneurial Speaker Series, this week's Global Entrepreneurship Programming, and the upcoming Virtual Startup Weekend, but also the virtual programs that help build out these dreams including the Entrepreneurial Toolkit Series, the upcoming Social Innovation Workshop in conjunction with the College of um, Continuing Education and the Virtual Mastermind Program. And to top this off as a hub, we have partnered with Fourth Wave for an accelerator for women-led tech companies and the Capital Region Small Business Development Center for Lean Innovators Series, as well as many of the great ecosystem partners, including our partners in the Multi-University Regional Collaborative, Start of SAC, One Million Cups, just to name a few. The Multi-Universal Regional Collaborative brings together all the universities in the region and their programming so we can all work together to actually grow the, the resources for our students in this region. By linking the region's entrepreneurs, wannabe entrepreneurs, and just curious entrepreneurs with all this region has to offer, there will be no stopping the creativity, innovation, and the new startups in our region. I wanna thank all of you for being part of this and to helping this journey for those that are starting their programs to those that are just building up their companies and need more tools. Together, we can make a difference for our region, for the entrepreneurs and for the world. So thank you for joining us today. And with this, I wanna turn it over to President Nelson to give some more great words. Thank you, Dale. I'm seated at the table in my dining room where Dale and I sat down, had a glass of wine or two or three, and we dreamed up this thing. And today we get to see those dreams come true. And we get to have tremendous support from, wealth, from Western Health Advantage and from so many others this has truly become a regional activity, an activity that is going to change the lives of so many different people and make a difference for them so that they can be successful. With COVID, things are not going to be the same. Entrepreneurs are going to be needed more and more every day. Today, we get to shape some of their future and we get to do it jointly. I'm proud of the Carlson Center. I am extremely proud that every one of the colleges tonight and throughout this week are going to be involved. This is a global event and we are part of it. Today, Cameron 
sent us a screenshot that showed that Sac State and Sacramento as a community was in the tops in being involved. And we will continue to be involved and we'll continue to see Carlson Center improve our community, improve the lives of everyone around us, pave the way for the future. It is my honor now to introduce Cameron Law. For a year, he's been working hard. I remember walking across the Capitol and seeing him and his girlfriend walking and they stopped and talked to me. And right then and there, I knew somehow or another, he had to be part of us, part of the Hornet family, even if he did go to Davis and play baseball there, but part of the Hornet family and part of us growing the next generation of entrepreneurs throughout this region and throughout this country. I'm very proud of you, Cameron, and I give you a very hearty stingers up. Awesome. Well, stingers up back to you, President Nelson. And thank you both Dale and President Nelson for the warm welcome this evening. I wish I had one or two or three glasses of wine with you when we were, uh, when you were founding the Carlson Center sounded like a great evening. And I imagine some napkin sketches for the future of the Carlson Center uh, came about, but I wanted to just say good evening to everyone and wanted to echo the sentiments that Dale and President Nelson shared and really welcoming you to Global Entrepreneurship Week powered by Western Health Advantage. We're really excited to have us all in one space, albeit virtually. I know it was uh, much more engaging to be in person at the Carlson Center last year, but we're excited to have all of you here virtually and really celebrating the role innovation and entrepreneurship plays in our ecosystem. Again, my name's Cameron Law and I'm the interim executive director of the Carlson Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I've also been selected to be the Sacramento organizer for Global Entrepreneurship Week here in Sacramento. Um, and I couldn't be more proud to have worked with a, a regional planning committee. We have some of them on our panel today and running an amazing uh, set of events throughout the week. I um, really appreciate their effort in putting together this week that put us on top of the leaderboard that I meant that President Nelson mentioned earlier. Uh, but I wanted to recognize our team as well. We have Arlene Miranda, who is our administrative systems and operations analyst. I would typically be pointing out to her in the crowd. Um, a little bit more difficult here in the virtual Zoom as functionalities are limited. We also have Brian Gladden and Jesse Becker-Alexander, who are our entrepreneurs and residents. And then Boniface Michael, who is our faculty and residents. And they've just been a tremendous team in pivoting in this virtual world and really you know, coming from a place of empathy and trying to work with our entrepreneurs and recognizing the challenges that they're facing. And I couldn't be more proud of our team in this space. Uh, additionally, I wanted to recognize and thank our Carlson Center Advisory Board for all of their guidance and support and really moving the center forward. As uh, President Nelson mentioned with Global Entrepreneurship Week, it is indeed global. So today we join over 180 communities in this week long celebration. We have everything from events, activities, competitions, networking and state of the unions like today. But really what we're most passionate about during Global Entrepreneurship Week is bringing people together because entrepreneurship is all about connecting and really supporting one another. And we're excited to have everyone from students to entrepreneurs, faculty, investors, and startup champions all in one space. So um, I came to you a year ago and really talked about what my vision for the Carlson Center was and our role in the community. I shared how we aim to be this regional hub and platform for providing approachable and accessible entrepreneurial education, a community, and the support to enable students and startup founders of all backgrounds to explore and launch their businesses. I demonstrated, you know, that our mission was to make this in make innovation and entrepreneurship pervasive throughout the greater Sacramento region and really stand in line with the university's work to be an anchor university and really anchoring our work in the community to better serve our constituents. I also shared with, us, with all of you the vision that we wanted to make the greater Sacramento region this premier hub of innovation and entrepreneurship. And I'm proud to say that 12 months, despite all of the challenges 2020 has thrown at us, that we've taken significant strides in serving as a collaborator, as a community and a re resource to students, entrepreneurs and ecosystem support organizations, as well as other higher ed um, institutions. 
Um, some of the major outcomes for me was, as Dale mentioned, was really moving away from this vision that the Carlson Center was just a physical space. I really wanted to embody that we are this community and this network to serve students and entrepreneurs no matter where they were in our community. And that was something that I'm really proud of us and taking those tangible steps forward. Uh, we also, as uh, Dale had mentioned, have mobilized multiple partnerships to better serve our entrepreneurs, everything from working with one of our key partners, Startup SAC, to expand our entrepreneurial speaker series program through their happy hours, which we have one tomorrow where we're featuring one of our Carlson Center advisory board members, Christopher Johnson. We're really proud of our partnership with Fourth Wave, which is a women-led technology accelerator. Um, we have an amazing event lined up on Wednesday to talk about the future of female-led um, innovation and entrepreneurship, and also highlighting all of our 13 female founders. We also built a partnership with the SBDC and launched a 10-week series. And then coming, uh, it's actually been live this week, is a partnership we launched with the City of Sacramento to bring to you an online mentoring platform called Mentor Sacramento. And so at the end of the day, I've just been really proud about the way we at the Carlson Center through our team have really engaged community partners and been that collaborator to better serve our community. Um, and so before we launch into this program um, where we, you know, I'm going to be introducing uh, Ian Hathaway, who's going to be our, our fireside chat conversation. I just wanted to say again, thank you for all of you being in this space and that it really takes a community to serve our entrepreneurs and our students and that we couldn't be um, more excited to have you here. So I'm going to unshare my screen and we're going to hop on into uh, me introducing Ian here. So um, before I introduce, I want to provide a little bit of insight of why, why Ian and why this conversation. And so as I, as I look at our mission to make innovation and entrepreneurship pervasive throughout the greater Sacramento region, and the way we try to serve on and off campus to foster that startup community and that entrepreneurial ecosystem, I saw how students try to navigate these systems and how different actors and stakeholders play different roles. And sometimes they don't, as students or entrepreneurs, don't even know what roles um, enable them to ultimately be able to grow and foster those businesses. And so I, after reading Startup Communities and then Startup Community Way, which uh, Ian co-authored, provided me with some more clarity and some language around what it means to really make innovation and entrepreneurship more accessible and really building that entrepreneurial ecosystem and that community to support entrepreneurs. And lastly, was when I started, you know, really kind of moving back to Sacramento after moving abroad, I really recognized how we had had always embraced this cow town and government identity and believing that in order for us to really realize that uh, mission or that vision we have of being a premier hub of innovation and entrepreneurship, we really need to take a step forward and really recognizing what assets we have in our backyard and how we can really start to uh, move innovation and entrepreneurial growth forward. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our um, our fireside chat participant, Ian Hathaway. So Ian is an, is an analyst, strategic advisor, writer, and entrepreneur. He works with leading organizations to solve complex problems, uh, produce data-driven insights, develop new products, and shape competitive strategies. In addition to his research and advisory work, Ian has launched new ventures, helped young organizations get off the ground, and work with established firms to expand to new markets. Currently, he leads ecosystem development at Techstars, where he works with entrepreneurs, community leaders, and institutions around the world to support their path towards uh, building better ecosystems. Ian is an active startup advisor, mentor, and investor. He also is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and co-founder of a um, and board member at the Center for American Entrepreneurship. So we, we're in good hands and really understanding what entrepreneurship is, what startup communities, and how entrepreneurial ecosystems operate here with Ian. So uh, Ian, if you wanted to join me, and I think there we are with your, um, let me, we're going to unspotlight me. Okay, awesome. So we're good here. So um, Ian, jumping on into it, as I mentioned, uh, the Startup Community Way book is a great guide in understanding startup communities and entrepreneurial ecosystems. Could you share with us the motivations behind the book and how your experience in all these areas informed your insights through it, throughout it? Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Well, the first thing I want to say uh, is thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here. And, you know, I'm excited to, to kick off, um, well, what is a uh, what is a week-long celebration of entrepreneurship worldwide. 
Uh, also want to say quickly, Cameron, my wife went to Davis as well. So, you know, uh, I guess it's Aggies or Mustangs, whatever you want to call. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here. But yeah, so this book, right? So you mentioned startup communities. Um, my co-author, Brad Feld, he um, has been an entrepreneur, venture capitalist and community builder in Boulder, Colorado for, I guess, since 1995 when he moved to that community. Um, and he wrote a book in 2012 published called Startup Communities. Um, while many of the things in that book are concepts that we take, um, you know, as second nature today, at the time it was really revolutionary thinking. Um, I feel like in many ways that solidified this notion of a startup community, um, provided key practices that, you know, entrepreneurs and community builders around the world could then implement and adjust for their, in their communities. Um, flash forward to today, uh, in 2012, in July, Brad and I published a sequel or prequel, however you want to look at it, um, called The Startup Community Way, which really uh, took those concepts and evolved them. Um, whereas the first book was focused on Boulder, Brad's firsthand experience, it was much more practical in nature. You know, here are five things that we did in this domain. Um, here's what we felt worked. Here's what we felt didn't. Um, this book really focused, as you mentioned, Cameron, on the systemic nature of startup communities. And, um, you know, there, you know, I think this book is still practical in nature. There are a lot of principles that people can follow. We have case studies, one in each chapter. We actually intended to have much more of that. We intended for it to be much more practical than it turned out to be. Um, but what we observed along the way is that um, the systemic nature of startup communities and entrepreneurial ecosystems leads people to make predictable mistakes, number one. And number two, we noticed that, um, you know, in spite of all the language that's being used around ecosystem, right, this, this word has really become kind of mainstream and even entering discussions on economic policy agendas. Um, but people weren't really thinking about, well, what does it mean to be involved in a system, to work with a system, right? So um, basically three parts, three key parts to a system, the parts, the interactions or interdependencies, and then the purpose, what that system is meant to achieve. I felt like there was so much emphasis on the first thing, right? This accelerator program, this incubator, this startup, this program, and on and on and on, and less focus on the interdependencies, which... If you study systems, that's really what matters. And in this context, that means relationships. Fundamentally, startup communities for me, is it's about collaboration, um, plain and simple. And so with humans being the, the actors in this system, uh, it's really about human relationships. And so we really wanted to focus on that. We decided to spend um, an entire book laying that out. We wanted to put the science behind it. Um, Many community builders and entrepreneurs who are engaged uh, with building communities that we talk to, um, they understand this. It's second nature, this kind of bottom-up approach, experimentation, learning, adaptation, um, resiliency. But for a host of new actors who have really gotten, you know, the scope and the scale of new actors has really increased in the last decade. Um, institutional actors in particular, like universities, governments, corporations, those who have an organizational form and incentive structure that sometimes collides with the way a startup community functions as a bottom-up phenomenon. And um, so we wanted to explain the nature of these systems um, as human social systems, more or less, um, so that those new actors would understand how to engage better and to give those community builders a language and framework to engage with those new actors. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for that, Ian. And I, I know just from my own experience of, I was doing some of the work, but it is like, until you have some of the language, it, it empowers you to do it more and, and do it in a more thoughtful way and how to bring people actually in and help them, you know, guide them in their own ecosystem building or community building process. So I um, appreciate you one overall, just uh, sharing your, your knowledge and um, insight through the book. Um, so one of the things that, you know, was interesting to me when I looked into the book of, you know, really when you, when you look at startup communities and entrepreneurial ecosystems, we can't what, help but notice the difference in between structures and how information and knowledge flows. Can you share with us your thoughts um, and what you mean by networks of trust over hierarchies and kind of how that can help entrepreneurs in being successful? 
Yeah. So in startup communities today, and we're talking not just software startups, but we really are have been reorganized as a information and knowledge driven economy. Um, therefore, the critical resources that startups need to thrive and grow are intangible in nature, right? It's um, the way that key resources are exchanged are at an arm's length through relationships, right? And we call these, uh, the, the reason we call it networks of trust is that in my mind, uh, trust is the currency of exchange. So whether I'm sharing knowledge that's specific to the venturing process, whether you know, I'm mentoring you about you know, what your customer acquisition strategy might be, um, opening my network so that you can meet the right investor, right? This requires us getting to know one another and we're exchanging an informal way, right? The traditional market mechanism, which um, is set by prices where goods and services are bought and sold really doesn't work in this context, right? It's informal, it's fast paced. And so in order for people to open up, um, especially people who are different, right? Diversity is critical to functioning of a startup community and building startups. We need to bring everyone to the table um, because the combinations are potentially endless, right? We don't know where the answer is going to come from. Um, so in this context, it's just so much easier for uh, to, to open these, to open up our networks, to be helpful to one another. Um, there's a, a really good um, there's a really good framework for this which Brad has written about over the years has now become sort of the, I guess the motto or the hashtag of Techstars, which is give first. And, um, and the idea is pretty simple. It gets misunderstood, um, but it's basically look for ways to help entrepreneurs, um, big and small, without expecting anything in return. It's not pure altruism because you do expect to get something, um, but you just don't know from whom and what form and when. I like to think of this as, um, you know, transcending a transactional mindset, right? It allows the flow of, of ideas, talent, capital, information, relationships to move more quickly through these ecosystems. Um, and it's really kind of embracing that positive sum mindset um, rather than approaching things through this mindset of scarcity. It's really taking on a mindset of abundance. Nice. I, I love that give first mentality. I know that's something uh, Dale Carlson, our, our founder, you know, really spoke to when he started his company, Sleep Train Mattress Center. It was all about giving first and really supporting that. So I love that echoing that sentiment. And um, for us, you know, when I was kind of researching some of these questions, when you talked about networks, I think you quoted in one of your um, videos was, you know, networks are all about collecting and connecting dots. And I really found that that valuable of really like, how can we, you know, for us at the Carlson Center, you know, collect these dots and, and connect them to better build density for our entrepreneurs and, and support them um, and really help them navigate that. Cause it's really all about the efficiency from getting from point A to B and that density of a network helps them get there. Yeah. And I think so that, that collecting and connecting dots you're referring to um, well, this is from a friend of mine, Rick Tarosi, who is a community builder and investor in uh, Portland, Oregon. He has this great TED talk. If anyone in the chat room can find it and send it around, I would, I would love for you to share it. Everyone should watch it. Um, he, he's basically saying, look, I'll take a meeting with essentially anyone, uh, coffee, 20, 30 minutes. I don't know if I'm going to be able to help you in the immediate term. In fact, I often don't. If anyone knows Rick's self-deprecating humor, that's exactly what he would say. But the objective is to just be there, to listen, to be of help immediately if you can be. And if not, you're collecting that dot. So as you go along over the next few days, few weeks, few months, or even years, you're collecting more and more dots. And then a spark might happen where you say, oh, I couldn't help that person, but this person I just met is the exact person to help this person. And then you go and make that, that introduction. And I think it highlights one of the major challenges in this work, which is the long time delays. So much frustration and fatigue um, on community for community builders who are who want to see those feedbacks, right? Who want to see that success is happening. Uh, in particular, um, people who are funding these programs, right? Uh, you know, institutional actors in particular want to see those job creation benefits immediately. Um, but this stuff takes time, and that's really frustrating. And oftentimes, you can't even see the impact you're having, right? So if I'm collecting dots for months, and in order to make two fantastic connections months down the road, 
I may not even understand the impact that I've had by making that introduction unless I'm systematically following up. Um, but that's really what this work is about. It's really simple. Um, I would encourage people to try to mentor entrepreneurs um, uh, formally, informally, um, as best you can. Anyone can do it. You don't have to be a serial entrepreneur to be a, a useful mentor. You don't have to be an industry expert. You just have to be a person who can establish that empathy, be willing to help, as I said, in ways big and small, um, and just stick with it. And uh, that's really what this work is all about. I love that. Thanks for diving deeper into the, the connecting and, or collecting and connecting dots. Um, so the next question I had, so when we start to look at startup communities and entrepreneurial ecosystem, you know, capital is always something that is top of mind. Um, as long as I've been in the, the ecosystem here in Sacramento, we've always pointed to the need for financial capital to help scale our startups. Um, and I would agree that's an area for growth that we, we do need additional resources. Um, but I'd love for you to share a, 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 a little bit about um, some of the other forms of capital that we can leverage and how we can ultimately utilize those to enable further innovation and entrepreneurial growth in our region. Yeah, so this is probably the number one complaint in startup communities worldwide is we don't have enough capital. Uh, what is meant by that is we don't have enough financial capital, uh, in particular venture capital or angel capital. Um, there's all, you know, capital is a scarce resource. Um, I know that it may sound uh, kind of crazy to say that given, you know, your neighbors down in the Bay Area where it feels like the stream of entrepreneurial finance is endless, but it is, uh, you know, it's scarce even there. Um, so in response to that, one of the frameworks that Brad and I put forward in this book is called the seven capitals. Um, in it, it's just a framework for, you know, kind of conceptualizing and retaining what the, the key resources are in a startup community. Um, so entrepreneurs, of course, need much more than financial capital. Um, I would say the best financial capital is revenue from customers anyway, but let's put that aside for a minute. Um, you know, you've got intellectual capital, uh, which is, you know, ideas, information, technologies, human capital, skills and talent, right, embedded in people. Um, you've got institutional capital, uh, which is wide ranging in scope, can be everything from a system of laws to having uh, large and uh, collaborative anchor institutions in your community. Um, you know, uh, geographic capital, which we kind of say broadly is, uh, you know, quality of place, having good infrastructure. Maybe that's less of an issue in many parts of the United States, but around the world, even having reliable electricity uh, and broadband internet can be a challenge. Uh, we talk about cultural capital and network capital, right? Network capital is driving this all together and cultural capital permeates it all. And we, we describe these as capitals, first of all, just to kind of, it's a little bit of a play on that financial capital thing. Um, but it's also just reflects the nature of these resources, right? They produce value. Um, they're degradable, right? They require upkeep and investment and they're forward looking in nature. And so in this chapter, we kind of list, you know, a bunch of these different things I rattled through about, well, what are the resources that startups need to, to thrive um, in a place? And, um, you know, we put this framework around it for those reasons so that people could retain it uh, more easily. And so, you know, I think Cameron, we talked a little bit about um, the ridiculous example I like to use, which is if you dumped a billion dollars of venture capital into the middle of Antarctica, would it produce high growth startups? No, because it's missing all these other factors. And it is a ridiculous example. I acknowledge that, but it makes the point, right? Um, I also think that, you know, uh, financial capital, venture capital in particular tends to follow entrepreneurial successes. That's not talked about enough. Um, too often we look at the, the, the factors in high performing ecosystems. If you want to say the Bay area or New York or Los Angeles, and we equate those factors that are there today with what it took to get there. Right. Um, success and capital formation um, happen concurrently. These, these things co-evolve. Um, and so it's just important to, to remember that. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing the, the different values of the, the various types of capital and how we can ultimately utilize those to, you know, one, strengthen one another and, you know, I guess, you know, 
the interdependencies of those, right, and how they ultimately work together to, to grow a community for sure. Um, so um, another area of the book that I found particularly interesting and in, um, in some of your other talks was the notion of measurement and building metrics. Can you speak more to what you described as the measurement trap and what we should be looking to measure around startup communities and entrepreneurial ecosystems? Um, yeah, I could probably do this all day. So measurement, right? Whew. We have to track progress. We have to show that it's working. Um, if you would read the book, by the time we get to this section on our chapter on measurement, we've explained why it's really hard to measure the most important things. Uh, some of the things we talked about earlier, you know, how do we, how do you measure the impact and the value that's flowing through relationships? Right? How do you how do you measure uh, the value of introductions and whether they're actually getting um, to a positive result? Like that's really difficult. Um, we taught we framed this challenge as the measurement trap um, because we believe that there's an inverse relationship um, between the factors that are easy to measure and their long term impact on a startup community. So. The things that are least impactful over the long run are easiest to measure. Number of startups, uh, venture capital deployed, um, number of investors, maybe real estate uh, co-working spaces. Um, it's not that those things aren't, aren't important. It's just that they're not the most important long-term change. We're really talking about changing human behavior to be more collaborative, to be more positive some in, in thinking and changing their attitudes and mindset. That takes time. It takes repetition. It takes reinforcement. Um, in Brad's first book, Startup Communities, he talks about a 20-year view, which uh, is refined by saying it's not 20, it's, it's 20 years from today, right? So Brad will say, look, I've been in Boulder 25 years. I'm not minus five years. I'm 20 years from today, right? I'm moving, I'm looking at 45 years. And I just take that to mean, um, you know, it's a generational or even a lifetime view that what, you know, we should be viewing it through the lens of, entrepreneurs and, you know, we call instigators, community builders who aren't actively managing um, entrepreneurial ventures who have, or who haven't had high impact successes, uh, but are committed to spending the rest of their lives to making their communities better um, for entrepreneurs. Um, and, and so that's what it takes. Uh, it just takes, it takes a long time. Um, but what ends up happening is we, we need to demonstrate impact um, because of, you know, we want to show that we're making progress. Maybe we have um, funding sources that are requiring it. You know, we want to see jobs created. We talked about all. And so then strategies get implemented around uh, those factors when they may not be the right strategies, right? So we end up having, we end up taking poor approaches. And so um, we lay out a bunch of different, op you know, different approaches for measurement in the book. I guess I would just say, you know, there is no one approach. You have to be pragmatic, but really focus on what it is that you're trying to understand, right? Don't fall in love with these macro level indicators of startups created or venture capital deployed or exit, whatever, whatever your success metric is at a system level. It's what is the point of this program, right? Are we trying to draw in a wider funnel of entrepreneurs? Are we trying to increase the connectedness between first? right? Um, are we trying to teach them something uh, to get to a certain outcome? Knowing that those, those programs, those initiatives are meant to help entrepreneurs succeed, not guarantee, but help them succeed. And if, we're, if entrepreneurs succeed, then all these other things will come, right? You get into a cycle where that attracts more entrepreneurs and more talent. And, and so, just understanding what it is you're actually trying to, to measure and doing that rather than, you know, these macro level things, like I said. One really simple thing is to, um, you know, to capture the people that are engaging with your program or, you know, even attending this event uh, and reaching out to them and tracking those people over time. It's really simple, but it's just getting understanding of, is this working? What's not going well? It also has the positive effect of giving you that feedback so that you can shift strategy if it's not working. Um, so measurement is a complex thing. It requires a bunch of different approaches. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, it's not just a one size fits all silver bullet. 
So thank you for, for the in-depth uh, answer around measurement. And I know it's always a tricky thing, especially when you're, you know, bringing different um, actors in the community together to talk about, you know, what is our vision for the, the community and how do we, how do we measure that? So I think that that's um, super valuable information. So I have just a couple of questions left for you, Ian. Um, and I know this, um, so we've kind of talked, talked about it from the lens of the, the startup champion, the ecosystem builder as an entrepreneur, you know, what's a way that they can start to look at this um, in terms of one playing a leadership role, but also really tapping into this resource of an ecosystem and, and start to think, you know, how do I navigate as an entrepreneur and, and be more efficient in that kind of uh, business building process? Um, yeah, so these, these individuals um, are absolutely critical, especially to nascent ecosystems that haven't had tons of success. Uh, my friend Jeff Bennett in, in Sacramento is, a, in my opinion, he's one of these champions, right? Like these people are doing, um, they're doing amazing work and they provide uh, critical infrastructure to these communities. They provide a central point of contact. They draw entrepreneurs out of the woodwork. This is one of the major challenges. And in fact, it's one of the core criticisms of Brad's first book, which is that, you know, Boulder uh, was a fairly is a fairly collaborative, fairly self uh, organized community around entrepreneurs, and not every place is like that, right? Um, entrepreneurs are often introverted, right? They're um, you know diffuse, they're spread throughout a community, right? There aren't these critical uh, critical meeting points like this, critical uh, spots to to gather and to aggregate, and so providing those, especially early on. Um, is important. Secondly, I feel like those ecosystem builders, the instigators, as we call them in the book, and, <clears throat> and by the way, I should explain that we separate individuals uh, from organizations, right? Um, probably don't have time to dive too deeply into this, but we talk about the difference between communities and ecosystems, and we also talk about the difference between individuals and organizations, right? And this is actually a critical thing to understand that individuals can can serve a community, they can serve entrepreneurs in ways that are different than the organizations that they might even work for. Um, different interests, different incentives. Um, but that they're there to serve these, to serve the entrepreneurs, right? Uh, the best startup community builders, ecosystem builders, instigators, whatever you wanna call them, know that their customer, uh, that ultimately the end user is the entrepreneur and they're there to serve them. Um, they understand what their needs are um, yeah, and they're, they're there to provide that critical infrastructure that the entrepreneurs themselves may not be doing because they're busy building their companies, right? I think uh, over time, what we want to see is more entrepreneurs who have had success participating in that process, right? They don't have to lead these organizations, but serving in some way, maybe it's a board of directors, maybe it's an advisory role, maybe it's an EIR, maybe it's a financial thing, uh, maybe it's offering time or opening their networks, but that's one of the most important things is those entrepreneurs who have had success are recycling those resources, not just financial, but time networks and their knowledge back into the community. And those critical startup community builders, champions can be a critical vehicle for organizing those efforts. Awesome. Thank you. No, I, I love that. And I, um, I, I see the visual of those concentric circles of the startup community, you know, ecosystems and, and really looking at it through those different lenses um, and really seeing all the infrastructure that needs to be built in order to um, make that, you know, I guess, dense network to support an entrepreneur and that there's, you know, at the end of the day, it's about building those relationships and, and that trust amongst the ecosystem. So in our last question um, that I wanted to have for you was just, you know, what's some advice for an ecosystem? You know, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Sacramento region, but um, for an ecosystem, you know, similar to our size um, and, you know, kind of our past history, what would be some recommendations you would have of how our community can really grow and foster um, a, a evolving ecosystem and startup community? Well, uh, having these points of contacts, right? Like, uh, so Sacramento is a big place and landmass, right? It's really spread out. Um, you have a really unique time right now where I see, um, you know, talent is spinning out of the Bay Area. Um, I think that's something that's been going on much longer than the COVID crisis. Um, those people have amazing resources um, that they can bring to the Sacramento startup community. 
having being extremely welcoming to them, getting them excited about um, what's happening there. Um, you have to, of course, talk about that, right? So that's through events, that's through blogging. I think, by the way, that's one of the things that I encourage entrepreneurs to have had some success to do is to start blogging. That's how people can find you. It's really important. Um, and I know that sounds really simple, but actually that's how I think about a lot of this work. Um, it's simple, but not easy, right? Because it requires consistency. <laughs> it requires, you know, reinforced behavior. It requires having a long view. Um, it requires serving others, having humility, all these things that are sometimes difficult to, to achieve at a community wide level. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, like I said, it's having, having these points of contact, having these entry points, these on ramps, making sure that anyone who wants to be a part of this is included. Um, and, and just, and charging forward. And, and, and like I said, having that long-term view and realizing that it will take some time. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us today, Ian, and sharing your, your wisdom and experience in building um, entrepreneurial ecosystems and startup communities. Um, I know it's been a personal pleasure to, to learn from you and, and read your, your work. Um, and I look forward to you know, this conversation informing our startup champions and, and better serving our region's entrepreneurs. Um, and really, I think you know, today is uh, hopefully taking a step in that direction to talk about the Sacramento ecosystem and you know, continue to foster that conversation. So really appreciate you being here and sharing your expertise and look forward to, to staying in contact. And hopefully we can find a way to, to plug you further into the Sacramento entrepreneurial ecosystem. I would love that. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun to be here. Wonderful. Well, we're going to head on over now to our, our virtual panel discussion. Um, and just wanted to, again, say thank you, Ian, for your time and uh, sharing your experience and expertise with us. So jumping in, um, we put together a panel of some uh, of our Sacramento entrepreneurial ecosystem thought leaders um, and some that, you know, really look at our key actors and factors. So those are some of the language from uh, the startup community way, actors being the set of people and organizations involved in it. And then the factors are those groups of resources that really build that vibrancy of those local conditions to impact entrepreneurship. So I want to start by introducing our panelists at a high level, and then I'll have them introduce ourselves. So on our panel, we have Anna Strauss, who's the co-founder and CEO of Spark, Arlen Orchard, who's the former CEO and general manager of SMUD and now the chair of the California Mobility Center, uh, Mariah Lichtenstern, who's the founding partner of Diversity Ventures, a fellow at the Aspen Tech Policy Hub, and the managing director of the, the Founders Institute Sacramento chapter. We also have Matthew Magno, who's the co-founder and CEO of JAPA, and the co-founding and director of Plasma at UC Davis. And then we have Ruth Yamtubian, who's the head of the VSP Global Innovation Center. So we will um, pin there, we will spotlight them. So we'll add the spotlights here. So um, jumping in, let's start with, um, give me a second here, we're spotlighting everyone. All righty. So in jumping in, um, so can you uh, each introduce yourself and share with us, you know, a little bit about your company? We'll start with Anna and we'll have you kick off. Yes, of course. Thanks so much for having me. So excited about this week and just the whole community coming together to support the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So my name is Anna Strauss. I'm one of the founders and CEO of Spark, and we help companies increase productivity and retention with their top talent by really uncovering how they feel appreciated in the workplace. We do this with our personalized recognition platform that really equips managers with the tools and insights to build stronger relationships with their team. Thank you, Anna, for sharing a bit about yourself and Spark. We'll pass it on over to Arlen. Great, thank you. It's a, really a pleasure to be with everyone tonight. I wish we were doing it in person, but um, obviously that would be foolish at this point. So um, I'm Arlen Orchard. I um, just recently uh, finished a six and a half year, uh, I guess, tour of duty, I guess would, I would call it as the CEO of SMUD. Uh, which is our local electric utility company. And I'm proud to say one of the most innovative utilities in the nation. But uh, I, I finished up there in October and have been uh, focusing my efforts um, in my role as chair of the California Mobility Center. And I have the honor of serving on that board with uh, President Nelson. So it's 
uh, his support has been um, instrumental. So for those of you who aren't fully familiar with the CMC at this point, we're a public-private consortium whose uh, goal is to accelerate innovation and commercialization of new products, services, and technologies in the clean mobility space. We're um, focused on creating an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, large and small businesses, investors, and academia to really build uh, world-class companies in this um, space. Our founding members include SMUD, um, Sacramento State, uh, UC Davis, Greater, Economic, uh, Greater Sacramento Economic Council, Terzo Power Systems, which is a local startup, and we've had a lot of um, support from the city of Sacramento and Los Rios Community College. Um, we began our formation activities in mid-2019, and I'm proud to say are quickly moving towards the launch of commercial opera uh, operations uh, the first quarter of 2021. And we are doing a soft launch fourth quarter of this year with our first cohort of um, startups. So uh, it's an exciting time for us. Wonderful. Thank you, Arlen. And we look forward to, to seeing the CMC make an impact in the region and further build out the, the mobility sector of our region. So next we'll have uh, Mariah introduce herself. Good evening. So first of all, thank you for having me here. I, I just really want to commend you, Cameron, and your team for your exceptional leadership on this event and in our ecosystem at large. It's so wonderful just to hear from all of you um, about all that we've accomplished in the past year, despite this like phenomenal, like mind boggling pandemic that is still here. Um, but, uh, and I'm also very happy to be on the panel with each of you, some of you whom I've met before. So yes, I am Mariah Lichtenstern. I am the founding partner of Diversity Ventures, which is an impact oriented venture capital firm. So our mission is really to drive positive impact through entrepreneurship. And we do this by backing tech enabled companies with high potential for both the social, economic and environmental impact and outsized returns. And a part of the work that I do to both identify and generate, generate deal flow is to serve as an advisor for a number of startup organizations. So among them, um, Berkeley Sky Deck, um, Village Capital, Finance Forward, Fourth Wave Female Founder Accelerator, which we've mentioned here tonight and which Anna is a part of. Um, and uh, I've been on the Tech Advisory Committee for Cal Seed, which is a clean tech fund, a $24 million clean tech fund for three years now. I'm super excited about all the positive work that's coming out of that. Um, I also launched the, the Sacramento chapter of the Founder Institute, which is a uh, pre-seed accelerator. It's the largest pre-seed accelerator in the world. It's in 200 chapters worldwide. Uh, headquartered in Silicon Valley. I am a graduate and I slipped from Sacramento to Silicon Valley to participate and didn't want our local founders to have to go through that schlock. So I'm very happy that one of our graduates is in fourth wave. They're going out and participating in other ecosystem events, both here in Sacramento and nationwide. Um, so that's part of the work that I do. And most, most recently, I've become an Aspen Tech Policy Hub Fellow where I'm working to close the tech funding gap for underrepresented founders. Thank you, Mariah. And, and uh, Laura had a great um, point in the chat was, you know, you're engaged in so much. So we appreciate you plugging into to all the things in the ecosystem and, and continuing to foster that growth. So next we have uh, Ruth. Can you share a little bit more about you and your work at VSP? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Ruth uh, from VSP's very new Global Innovation Center. Uh, we are just getting started. Uh, so this is one of the first events that we've participated in as the VSP Global Innovation Center. Um, I just joined VSP um, during the pandemic at the, at the height in, in early April. Um, and ha I think we've certainly had to innovate as an organization. So we've seen that really in real time and I've been on the receiving end of that. Um, I am new to Sacramento and new to VSP, but I'm not new to corporate innovation. I used to run AT&T's Foundry program, which was located in um, cities across the US, other tech hubs um, like Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, as well as across the world in Israel um, and Mexico City. Um, so very familiar uh, as, as Ian spoke about the many dynamics uh, across not only Silicon Valley, but multiple um, innovation hubs and how they've each been able to kind of leverage their own experiences and flavor to build a entrepreneurial community. Um, and so excited to do that for VSP um, and Sacramento. And so I'll, I'll share a little bit more about our ecosystem driven approach and how that's a, a unique new strategy for the company. 
Thank you, Ruth. And, and definitely, yeah, welcome to VSP. We're glad to see the, the role they're playing in our entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we're excited about the future of uh, VSP and helping the ecosystem grow. So jumping into the main part of our conversation, um, I wanted to start by uh, asking Anna, um, you got your start here as an entrepreneur and leveraged different resources and turning from an entrepreneur into forming a startup, which, which is Spark. I'd love if you can share with us the transition of being an entrepreneur into a startup and what were some of those different resources you tapped into here locally and what you needed, needed to tap into elsewhere. Yeah, thank you. So I, I'd have to say that the transition in Sacramento was absolutely seamless when it comes from a support perspective. Um, Ian was touching on it, but relationships are so critical. And I feel like that's one of Sacramento's biggest competitive advantages as we look at other markets in the U.S. We are very relationship focused. And so while I made that transition, I just reached out to community leaders who became advisors on our team, became mentors, became partners, whether they were on the CPA side or lawyer side, um, and some of the more formal resources that we tapped into was Fourth Wave, which has been mentioned. And I just have to say it has been absolutely transformative, such an amazing partnership with the Carlson Center and with Fourth Wave coming from L.A., just really focusing on positioning our business to scale, but also leadership development. So. Um, I couldn't be more thankful. Another great resource that we've tapped into is Haney Biz. They have been a great mentor for us, an investment partner. Um, also, huge opportunities from a vis visibility standpoint. So they have the pitch competition and the radio show that we've been on. And just kind of getting that exposure has opened up doors to potential clients and investors. And just kind of still staying on that same wave of the visibility piece um, other kind of opportunities outside of quote unquote resources um, is also the King's Capitalized Pitch Event, which is just really touting innovation and putting what's happening in Sacramento on the global stage. So um, those are some of the immediate resources that come to mind. Um, a few others, like just from workspace perspective, IO Labs has been phenomenal. Uh, Startup SAC. I love getting their newsletters and seeing kind of what opportunities are in the pipeline and what's happening in the region. Um, and the last one is uh, Winning Streak Ventures in Sacramento Angels. So just kind of starting out some of our fundraising, they've been really instrumental for us to just kind of get things off the ground. Thank you, Anna, for sh sharing your uh, entrepreneurial experience and what you've tapped into here locally and how, you know, you had to tap into some additional resources. And I've loved having you part of the fourth wave program and learning more about you as a, as a leader, but also your entrepreneurial um, skills and um, spark as a company. So next, I'm going to pass it over to Mariah. So you play, you know, oh, looks like we have uh, Matt here. So apologies. I think he was locked out as a, an attendee. So we, we figured out the zoom room. We were holding him back for all of you. So he is here. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll hit you with the same question I asked Anna. I'm sorry to put you right on the spot, but um, we'll stay with the flow that we had originated with. So you got your start here as an entrepreneur and tapped into and leverage different resources and turning from an entrepreneur into your startup uh, Japa. would love to learn more about that transition from an entrepreneur into that startup and what you tapped into here locally as well as elsewhere. Where. Yeah, definitely. And um, I just want to say thanks again for having me, Cameron, and everybody. This is such an awesome opportunity to just be um, talking to everyone. But yeah, um, you know, starting Joppa at, at, as, at, at, the, at UC Davis as a student, you know, it, it poses a lot of challenges. Um, but, you know, we tapped into a lot of resources. There's a ton of resources that, you know, not only the university had, but the whole community. You know, um, being students growing the company, you know, we, we reached out to organizations like Venture Catalyst to help us get incorporated. Um, we literally made um, the Student Startup Center, which is like the Carlson Center, our second home where we spent 12 hour days every Saturday just to work on our, our, our company. And, um, you know, even people at the Big Bang, you know, to help support us and give us um, mentorship and all those resources through them, uh, that helped us out a lot. Um, even going outside of the university, um, like Anna said, uh, the King's Capitalized Competition is such a great opportunity to have because not only does it, it sets up the companies for success, but, you know, it puts them on the map and spotlights them to really give, um, 
to benefit them as a whole. So, you know, Kings Capitalized, Startup Sack, these organizations, those are all things that we really utilize to really grow our company. Thank you, Matthew, for, for sharing the, the different resources and, and ones that really helped propel you and, and JAPA forward. Um, I love the Kings Capitalized competition as well. It's always a great one to see entrepreneurs telling their story and uh, um, always got to enjoy being in the, uh, the VIP room of the, the Kings um, arena. Yeah. So, um, so next up, we'll uh, ask in Mariah. So you play a multi-actor role in our community as an investor, entrepreneurial support organization, and an advo- advocacy group. Um, each of these bring unique value to the ecosystem. Can you share with us the connection between your investing and advocacy um, or vice versa and how they can impact our region and evolving our community and ecosystem? Absolutely. So, um, yes, I wear many hats, but all in one head and (laughs) they all have, you know, really the same core. And that is uh, economic impact through entrepreneurship. And uh, there can be social and environmental impact that is had by virtue of that economic impact. So um, I'll just give an example of, you know, the work that I do as an investor and advocates and in the advocacy role. Number one, investors are advocates, right? We should be the number one advocates for the founders that we serve. We should also be advocates for the investors that invest in us, right? So um, we have to be able to mediate on both sides um, that role. And um, here at Diversity Ventures, I like to say that we capitalize on diverse pr- perspectives, which is which are known to achieve alpha. The Kaufman um, Fellows researchers have found that um, founders that are diverse uh, outperform their homogenous counterparts in both uh, realized exits. We've had multiple studies that have shown that diverse teams, both gender um, and ethnic wise, outperform. Uh, and, and we know that there's other types of diversity, whether it's geographic, socioeconomic, veteran status, et cetera, uh, that can also contribute to that diversity. But unfortunately, uh, what happens is that underrepresented founders face disproportionate barriers to even getting on the field of uh, becoming founders. And so, um, you know, one of the, the, the main areas of that that I've identified in my advocacy work is around the friends and family round. So because of the wealth gap, the wage gap, um, and uh, income inequality in this country, uh, we see that some founders, they, they just don't have access to the earliest stage of funding that can get them to a place where they're venture backable. So my work at the Aspen Tech Policy Hub, um, it's called the Tech Funding Equity Project, it's at techfundingequity.com. Um, it really addresses this problem that creates a bottleneck Uh, for high potential founders who oftentimes through no fault of their own don't have the same risk tolerance as their represented counterparts. They're less likely to make it to a venture backable position. And so we're unable to invest in this, you know, talent pool that's out there. And when they do get on on the field, um, they oftentimes are taking on way more risk than they should have to. So, um, you know, while this disproportionately impacts underrepresented founders, namely, you know, women, uh, Black and Latinx founders, uh, you know, definitely uh, Indigenous founders, um, and and so many others for whom the data is not even collected because it's so small. Like for a long time, there was no data on Black women in venture capital until Project Diane came out. Um, Catherine Finney had pioneered that, and now that we have the data, we've measured it. You know, we can address goals around um, creating more equity, and so. Uh, with this kind of work, I see that, um, you know, by opening up this this talent pool that's undervalued, underutilized, uh, you know, just ignored because usually it's like, oh, well, they're not in because insert excuse here. We're actually saying, no, let's look at the data. Let's do this work so that we can get them in. And if they're known to achieve alpha, then we're unlocking that potential. And so, again, while this disproportionately does impact these underrepresented founders, it impacts our entire economy. Um, the uh, the global policy solution, the Center for Global Policy Solutions found that uh, discriminatory financing practices and bias towards companies primarily operated by white males uh, cost the United States over 9 million jobs and 300 billion in collective national income annually. And those are jobs that go to white men, black men, women, people of every background. It's, it's not, it doesn't discriminate. The bias is across the board. And then we've also found um, through McKinsey and company that closing the racial wealth gap can add um, 
five to seven points to our GDP um, and over a trillion dollars to our economy in less than a decade. And again, those are benefits that impact us all. So we all suffer from these systemic issues. And so by you know incorporating the ad advocacy work into our thesis, we're again unable to uh, we're able to unlock those benefits for diversifying founding teams, regardless of whether the founders are underrepresented or not, and by opening up new doors of opportunity to underrepresented founders and the and those who invest in them, right? So um, that's kind of how we see the pieces working together, whether it's advocacy, investing, um, entrepreneurial support organizations, we're all working together, just as uh, as you mentioned in the fireside chat, I um, mean, that whole conversation, we're working together um, to be the rising tide that lifts all boats. Awesome, thank you, Mariah. And, and I know I've just from our conversations, the you know we've always talked about yeah, there's the the moral component of it, but even more so, you know, there's an economic opportunity that um, it really does create opportunity for you know whole region or you know at a larger scale even our nation, right? And so um, I love the work that you do and um, enjoy working with you and promoting um, you know underrepresented founders or underinvested founders. So appreciate all that you do for our ecosystem. So uh, next up, we have uh, Ruth. So, you know, looking at large corporations and the role that they play, you know, it's often sometimes underappreciated role that they play in the startup communities and these entrepreneurial ecosystems. You know, they have this ability to create spinoff companies, serve as a talent magnet to a region, and also play a make or break role as a partner for a startup, whether that be as a customer, a supplier, a collaborator, or an investor. Can you share with us the role VSP's uh, Global Innovation Center plays here locally and in working in innovation entrepreneurship, as well as its global ability to connect uh, Sacramento? Yeah, so I, I'm gonna be real with everyone. We're all gonna have to work together to really understand what VSP's Global Innovation Center's role will be within the innovation entrepreneurship community here. I can tell you from VSP's point of view what our objectives are and how I believe that could really raise everyone up together um, within the Sacramento community. But I think it's a um, taking some innovation principles. It's something that we're going to have to calibrate over time together. It won't be, just be a one way um, street. But I think that as we um, sort of become more, have more integrity in our process and look at innovations globally, um, that will really cause everyone to up their game here and not just maybe invest in their friends' startups, but start to look at um, the levers uh, with um, more, more kind of a uh, uh, criticalness, which is, I don't think, a bad thing. Um, and what we're doing at the Global Innovation Center is we are the front door um, to startups in multiple industries. So we are a vision care benefits company, we are a network of optometrists, and we are an eyewear company. And that's just the top line. So we impact multiple industries and are looking to source ecosystem-driven innovation, meaning from with outside our walls, um, new solutions, the very best that, of tech vanguard and what that has to offer. Um, and so we're looking at a global level and taking the best of glo global tech. It's being synthesized here in Sacramento. So that synthesis is happening here. These conversations are happening here. And then we're pushing that back out, whether it's an optometrist in Brooklyn, an employee who needs vision care benefits in Florida. Um, we, we need the, the best customer care technology, the best virtual try-on technology, sensor and eye movement detection, um, virtual retail, all of this tech is going to be evaluated within Sacramento. And so if you think about how we can be a platform um, within our community for framing up really interesting, interesting problems in technology and experience and health and wellness, um, that's something that we can do together as an entrepreneurial community. And so when you think about the different types of capital that we discussed, the infrastructure, the access to challenges that matter, um, the network of people and partners, that cultural capital, um, we're going to be having people walking through the city um, from across the world to meet with the Global Innovation Center. And so that can only cause everyone um, to up our game and frame those interesting problems together. And so the VSP Global Innovation Center wants to be a platform globally, and therefore, you all have kind of first right of way um, as our neighbors um, and local com community. And I'll share in the chat here, we just launched our first futures report, which is one of those platforms. So if you think about one of the local community uh, startups, 
in Sacramento, partnering with us, meeting with us, being included in this futures report with CB Insights, um, another global business intelligence platform that gives um, uh, you all the reflected glory that VSP has in being a global brand and a global innovator. Thank you so much, Ruth, for, for sharing the, the vision for VSP's Global Innovation Center. And I know the first time that we met, we had a, a really great discussion about Sacramento. We sometimes, and I, I've even found this myself, of where we think very like regionally and how do we continue to work here? And then you really kind of made me take a step back and say, hey, you know, we do have this global community that we can connect to. And, you know, I think a, an event and week like this where it's all around global entrepreneurship and really connecting and looking out where out outwardly where there's other markets and resources that we can tap into. So thanks for providing us that perspective. So our next question goes to, to Arlen. So we know you're the prior, uh, at, at your prior role of C, uh, CEO and general manager of SMUD, um, you ultimately created the California Mobility Center and the, the CMC will play a unique actor role in our community and really mixing with the entrepreneurial support, but also on the investment side. So can you share with us the role CMC hopes to play in the ecosystem and the key partners it foresees once it's you know fully operational. I know you mentioned that there were some some pilot programs coming up here soon. Sure, thanks. Um, first, before I answer the question, let me give a shout out to Ma uh, Matthew because uh, when Smud recently redid our headquarters, uh, we were able to incorporate his uh, smart parking uh, technology into our building. So it's uh, into our parking garage. So it's cool when a big company can help support a uh, startup in their vision. So anyway, I just want to give a shout out for him and his uh, innovation. So I think it's, um, as I think about the CMC, it's important to understand what we aren't. We're not an accelerator. So rather, we think we provide a valuable next step um, on the path to commercialization. I think we're, um, we believe we're uh, filling what is currently a white space between the work done by traditional accelerators and go to market. So our ultimate goal is really to facilitate um, rapid commercialization of new products and um, technologies. So we're really focused on the next kind of two to three year window and then that three to five year window when we're kind of looking at our focus. Um, it's not to say accelerators don't play a valuable role. They play a crucial role. And I, we're hoping a lot of the local accelerators will end up feeding um, into the um, CMC and our processes. Um, I think the white space that I'm talking about is that in you know, a lot of cases, folks work through an accelerator. And then what, what, what they discover is, um, and that's true for both industry leaders and startups, that that next step, a successful working relationship is often challenged by differences in culture, pace of progress and risk tolerances. And so in some cases, those um, challenges can slow or even derail commercial progress for a startup. So um, the CMC were really focused on um, creating a commercialization collaborative. And um, we're looking at creating a single point of entry to California resources to create a faster path from concept to commercialization. Um, at CMC, we like to say that we curate commercially meaningful connections for startups to a wide range of resources to help them accelerate, streamline, and uh, reduce costs. So as an example, the CMC curates partnerships between innovators and industry incumbents um, early in the innovator's journey. We provide access to a talent pipeline through key partners like Sacramento State, UC Davis, Los Rios Community Colleges, and nonprofit partners. Um, we create opportunities for uh, capital investment. Ian talked about um, the different uh, capital streams that are a challenge. So alongside the CMC, we're setting up a uh, venture capital firm through our partner, Intertech Capital. And um, we can also, uh, the CMC will also, um, uh, through one of our service providers, uh, support innovators in the uh, quest for state and federal funding through grant opportunities. The CMC will help navigate the regulatory environment and uh, connect service providers and others um, to demonstrate and validate new products. So we're going to be uh, providing support for startups at every stage, including technology, product development, advanced manufacturing, 
testing and validation and uh, commercialization or uh, market um, entry. We um, will do that through this um, collaborative. Really, you look at it from uh, three big categories. The first are what we call CMC cl uh, uh, clients, which um, are startups. Um, there is an innovation that we're focused on our autonomous driving, connected vehicles, EVs, charging and other related infrastructure and technologies, smart and shared mobility, and then on-road and off-road applications. And then CMC uh, members, um, first and foremost, we want the CMC to be an industry member driven organization. We think that will increase the, the uh, reach of the CMC and provide a really invaluable connection between innovators and our industry members. So a wide range of uh, corporations, institutions and governmental agents, um, agencies that have a vested interest in fast but smart and safe transition to a future mobility products and services. So think about uh, OEMs, those are, uh, and tier one suppliers, those are auto companies and parts suppliers, electric utilities, tech uh, companies, vehicle fleet operators and uh, owners, uh, government agencies, universities as members. And um, so uh, that's the membership category. And then finally, um, the CMC will have a relatively small uh, staff where we're trying to curate and manage all of these relationships and interconnections. Um, and we'll do that. Um, a lot of the services we'll provide will be through our preferred service providers, which will help uh, clients and industry members um, navigate the business, technical, financial, and regulatory challenges for a uh, successful commercial launch. Uh, our service providers are leaders in their field. Um, one that we've already secured is uh, uh, out of Aachen um, University and or uh, Aachen, Germany, and they will be um, helping us with our ramp up and prototyping facility. Um, another one I just mentioned was Intertech Capital, which will uh, be providing a potential route to um, financing for startups. So we'll be working on interconnecting and facilitating um, all of the relationships between these different parts to help um, accelerate commercialization for these startups. So I think I'll go ahead and stop there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Arlen. And I, I love the way you started of, of sharing what it's not, right? And I think that's a key thing for our ecosystem to understand is obviously what you do, but also what it's not and how we can better um, partner and connect. So I appreciate finding that that white space that you're in. And so we can better connect the entrepreneurs in whatever stage they might be um, to, to leverage the resources that the CMC is playing. Um, so keeping us moving forward. So um, in, in our conversation with Ian, we one of the the quotes that they had in the startup community way that he mentioned was you have to have a long-term vision and really that view from 20, 20 years from today to emphasize the importance of both the startup community to a city and the long-term view for everyone and anyone involved in that startup community. So I wanted to start with asking our entrepreneurs. So we'll start with Anna again. Um, so starting with, um, so really looking at, you know, as an entrepreneur, where do you see um, our, our region heading in 20 years, but really in the, through the lens of how do we better serve entrepreneurs and startups um, as we begin to, to have that 20 year vision? Yeah, great question. So it's come up a few times, but obviously capital is always top of mind as an entrepreneur. And I'm just so inspired by hearing everyone's comments today around the collaboration and the synergy and partnerships that are evolving, because that's so critical to help expedite these high growth companies to get to market and see success. And so kind of just looking at a capital perspective, like a few things that I already see that are in the works, but I definitely think we'd get the largest ROI with more investment and energy in these areas is first just looking at additional collaborations with VCs outside of the Sacramento region, looking at the Bay Area, the most innovative economy in the entire world is on our doorstep. And I know that those relationships are already starting to take place, but there's a huge opportunity there. Just talking with some of the VCs, they're starting to allocate some of their fund dollars specifically to the Sacramento market and get outside of just the Bay Area. So some of the other areas that I've seen is just with private-public partnerships. 
Um, so this has been great with some of the cities or counties offering certain types of loans or incentives to startups to get ready um, to launch within their specific area, but also bridging connections to existing companies that are headquartered or located within their back door. A lot of these city officials are such great partners. They're trying to uncover what resources they need to be successful. And there's so much innovation right here in Sacramento that can help solve those problems, which kind of leads me into the next way. My next idea is outside of just kind of the public-private partnership, but also how can companies be equipped to know what solutions are being developed in our region. There's challenges that are being faced and they don't realize that there's a solution right around the corner from them in their own backyard. And one thing that I've absolutely loved is since COVID has hit, there's been a tremendous amount of Sacramento leaders and companies that have directly reached out just to support companies uh, within our community, which is so inspiring. And I feel that we can truly build off of that. Um, the last thing that I'll kind of suggest is just industry partnerships. Um, you mentioned it earlier, Cameron, but just looking at those strategic partnerships to help with your go-to-market strategy, you know, for example, one of our biggest areas is HRIS systems, and there is an internal champion at a global company that came from Sacramento that reached out, and now we're integrating with their software. We're going to have access to over a thousand companies, and just that introduction alone is so critical. It's we're keeping our equity, it's revenue in the door, and we get to expand our impact. So just kind of looking at capital in a different way and leveraging our strengths within this region, I think could go a long way. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I love the, the, the end for sure of leveraging the strengths we already have here for sure. So we can tap into those. And I know we all often look to how close the, the Bay Area is. And I hear due to COVID, a lot of them are moving this way. So hopefully we can um, continue to engage them and, and have them invest here locally. So um, same question to you, uh, Matt, um, is just, you know, what are some of your thoughts when you think of 20 years out? What are some of the things that you continue to want to see to better serve entrepreneurs and our startups? Yeah, definitely. Um, I want to say, I mean, the obvious question is, I mean, the obvious answer is, is capital. But to me and through my experiences, I think there's an overarching problem above over that, which um, I want to say it's connectivity. Um, Ian, you know, mentioned it, other uh, panelists, uh, panelists mentioned it too. But see, when I think about the Sacramento region, I think about, I think a lot about economic growth. And when I think about economic growth, um, I totally believe that success breeds more success. So when you, when you think about Sacramento, I mean, we do a great job of doing that within the entrepreneurial ecosystem. You know, we have organizations like Startup Sac, we have, you know, Laura and Jeff there, we have um, the Mayor's Tech Council that's pushing innovations a lot. All of these people that are serving within these organizations, all these roles are, I see them acting. I mean, I guess what Ian said earlier is invest our instigators, but I call them ambassadors, um, each entrepreneurial ecosystem ambassadors. And we need more of them. You know, we need to connect these people. These people are, are connecting entrepreneurs with other organizations, uh, philanthropy, uh, educational institutions, everything to really put them on the map. And, um, you know, a lot of this before was left up, left to like private and nonprofit institutions, but it's so great to see that the city and, and, and all the communities are coming together to really push innovation. Um, yeah, I mean, like it's the era of growth and Sacramento, you know, we are becoming, to my, to my opinion, I think we're becoming the next Silicon Valley um, and we're popping out new, new innovations left and right. And I think it's really important to highlight those innovations, highlight the successes of all these startups. So not only can we bring interest in investors to those companies, but also to the community as well, because we can give back to everything here. So I think it's really, really important just to, to be connected with everybody from entrepreneurs to the community organizations, because that's what's really going to help these startups. And I mean, it's a time to do it. Definitely. Love that. And the uh, success begets success. That uh, makes me think of one of the, the components in the book was talking about the tipping points, right? And so it's where you have those successful entrepreneurs coming back and providing not only that financial investment back into the community, but also that knowledge share of how to take a scalable startup and ultimately scale it to be a successful venture. So thanks for pointing that out, Matt. Um, so our, our next question in same, same vein of that 20-year vision is uh, to Mariah. So through an investor and advocacy lens, 
where do you see the Sacramento region's uh, startup community and entrepreneur, entrepreneurial ecosystem heading? And um, what do we need to do to get there from your, from your perspective? Well, one of the things that I think is so exciting about living in our region is that we are the capital of the fifth largest economy in the world, being the state of California. We are the capital of the state of California. And so we should be leaders in so many ways, not just in our own ecosystem, but in the world. And so my vision for this region is that we embrace that and that we become uh, a representation that, and that we have ro robust representation of uh, very smart connected capital in the capital region um, and that we are also a global leader in sustainability and an inclusive entrepreneurship. So, for example, we're also the fourth most diverse city in the nation um, and we're diverse in so many ways, not only ethnically, but just the geography that, you know, th that we see, you know, we have, you know, rural areas, we have ag tech, we have civ tech, we have so much um, to offer that's already here. Um, and I see us really building upon that and going outside of our comfort zone and what is known to really define ourselves. You know, when I think that we, we talk about Silicon Valley and what was Silicon Valley, it was a bunch of orchards <laughs> and then it became like microwave Valley. And what, it was a war effort, right? That in, during World War II, where the government came and invested in companies that were that were there. And we had, you know, um, Stanford and, and, and Berkeley and, and Lawrence Livermore Lab and all contributing to the war effort. And so, so much technology was de-risked by the government investment. Um, and we have a new, you know, a whole investment class of venture capital that was born out of that. We're in such a unique time with this global pandemic and exposing so much around, um, you know, social justice and Black Lives Matter. And, you know, I think that we should lean in to being willing to be uncomfortable you know part of the hard work when it comes to diversity and inclusion is that it's uncomfortable so when you look at the data around the outperformance of diversity um, it comes with you know some short-term sacrifices there's a, a reduction in efficiency in the short term because people are uncomfortable there's cognitive dissonance for one you know around people even belonging right so much that we've not learned about each other right and then once you become comfortable with being uncomfortable it becomes comfortable and then you can really harness that you know those diverse perspectives right and so in so many other aspects of life, when we get outside our comfort zones, um, we're able to grow exponentially. So I think this is a wonderful time to embrace, you know, the pain that we've experienced and, and just let this be like a birthing pain of a new era in our capital, getting outside of, you know, um, what we've held to be true for so long around, you know, re remote workers, for example, it used to be everyone had to go to Silicon Valley because that is Mecca. Well, guess what? The network effects became network defects, right? And now all of that is out the window and it could have been out of the window a long time ago. So I think, you know, what I see in the next 20 years is us really like being willing and bold to define, redefine ourselves and to go beyond like this box that, you know, we're put in a lot of times as individuals, as organizations, as regions, you know, we look at how other people see us and we begin to perceive ourselves and express ourselves that way. And I think Sacramento is really doing a great job to start to like to to own our own narrative and really redefine and go beyond the borders. And that's what so many wonderful cities, when you look at South by Southwest or what's going on in Boulder, Colorado, or so many other ecosystems that are burgeoning is that willingness to go beyond what you've been defined as. So that's what I see. I see us um, becoming a, a capitalized capital region and being a, a leader in sustainability and inclusion and entrepreneurship. Love that. Thank you, Mariah. And um, I saw in one of your earlier posts was put the capital in the capital region. So I love that. And then, you know, I couldn't agree more with, you know, the having a dialogue might not be as efficient, but once you've kind of built those relationships and then actually truly dense network by actually having people that see each other and have that sense of belonging, um, imagine what that could do for our entrepreneurial ecosystem to really be radically inclusive and support entrepreneurs no matter where they are. So thank you for, for sharing that insight with us. Um, so we're, we're nearing the end. So we have just a uh, finishing this round of questions and then we'll have a lightning round. So we have, um, this one's to Arlen. So we as a region, both through the city of Sacramento, as well as just in conversations, have really had this, recognized this focus on mobility. So what is your vision for the startup community and entrepreneurial re region as it pertains to mobility um, and the California Mobility Center? Sure. Um, you know, I think, first of all, when you think about mobility, there is no better place than Sacramento. We are, we've heard, you've heard it several times. We are the capital of California. 
which is the most innovative state in um, the nation, where the when you think about um, electric vehicles, we're the largest market in the U.S. We're the second largest market in the world beyond behind um, China. The most innovative regulatory environment um, around um, clean mobility is happening right here in Sacramento. There's a lot of great entrepreneurship that has happened happening in this region. So this is the best place to do what we're trying to accomplish through the CMC. With regard to, we're looking at, the reason we want this to be an industry-led and driven um, organization is um, we want it to be seen big, as bigger than Sacramento. We want it to be broader. We think that we want to grow local Sacramento companies, but we also want to attract a lot of other in entrepreneurs to the Sacramento region and help them grow their companies. And so this industry membership will give us a, um, a national and global region doing that. We're taking a very programmatic view of this as we're working with startups. For early stage clients, we're seeking to ensure that uh, commercialization requirements are incorporated early in the manufacturing process to avoid costly re-engineering later in the process. So we're partnering at this very early stage with them. Uh, Mid-stage um, clients um, are gonna need field testing to test a prototype or validate its performance. So we'll be connecting them with demonstration partners um, we want to ensure at this level that um, the product is uh, commercially relevant and that the testing associated with it is uh, rigorous and uh, can be relied on. And then um, finally, for late stage um, clients um, who are ready for commercial launch, we want to connect them with deployment partners who will support the launch, including um, cutting an actual purchase order for the product or service. So the CMC programming really an anticipates and helps address some of the challenges large companies and startups encounter when working together. I think Ian talked about the necessity of collaboration. That's really what we are. We're a collaborative when we think about commercialization. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Arlen. And I love the um, intent of, you know, making not only just Sacramento this hub for mobility, but then also attracting that talent from, you know, throughout the um, nation, but also in the state to uh, this region to advance mobility. So um, wrapping up this question, we have uh, Ruth, and then we're going to have a lightning round. I mean, I know we're right at that 630 marker, so we'll just maybe be one minute over. So um, please bear with me. So um, Ruth, as the VSP Global Innovation Center expands its presence in the Sacramento region and connects more deeply into the community. How do you see it influencing the Sacramento region startup community and entrepreneurial ecosystem? Yeah, so first of all, I just got a lot of Sacramento pride out there <laughs> for a newbie. <laughs> that was pretty strong. Um, so uh, gr great that we have a lot of strong pride and uh, clearly some resilience and excitement and energy. Um, so really fantastic to see that. Um, I, I, going back to my last comment, just about being a platform and framing up industry in interesting problems, we really see ourselves as a network of partnerships. And so what that means is that we're connecting ideas and teams um, inside and outside VSP. And we're also um, bringing outside shifts into the line of sight for VSP. So the more that our partners can really um, bring those problems to our doorstep, um, the, the better it is for all of us in the ecosystem. Um, because uh, then we kind of have more problems uh, to work with. Um, I wanted to add a few things just about how we are really an aggregator of opportunities um, for not just VSP, but for patients, members. We have 90 million members, um, optometrists. And so I, I think the impact that entrepreneurs and startups can have through VSP is quite great. Um, we're really looking at I, uh, identifying shifts in consumer values. So it's not just about technologies, it's about cultural and value shifts um, and investigating those innovative health and retail focused solutions. So this is beyond tech. And, and so I just wanna share a few of those um, 
uh, areas we're exploring, we're exploring future impacts on things like sustainability and inclusive design. So things like gender fluidity. Um, and so to Mariah's point, I think that um, having this diverse environment here can really lend itself well to working um, with a, a company like VSB and being um, a diverse test market as well. So we have people in Sacramento from different political, socioeconomic, um, ethnic, age diversity, just all within one area. And that's a re very interesting aspect to this ecosystem here. One thing Silicon Valley, having spent a lot of time there and worked out of an office in Palo Alto for many years, one of the challenges we had is that Silicon Valley is often criticized for solving its own problems or not having a diverse tech mar uh, test market. And so we would go and pilot in a Palo Alto store. Yeah, I don't think you're gonna get uh, accurate uh, feedback. So we mostly look to other markets to test and pilot in those environments. So we'd look to, uh, like I said, Atlanta, Dallas, somewhere else. Um, it's always a great bonus also when startups come um, with prototypes and pilots tested in environments like Sacramento, not like those in Silicon Valley. Um, I wanted to share a company called C-Mines that I worked with a few years ago. They do AI in Latin America. So they would take Silicon Valley tech and test it out in Latin America when they could have probably tested it out here and had those diverse markets. But their idea was you can't test AI in Silicon Valley. You have to have that kind of socioeconomic, ethnic um, diversity. So I would say that's one kind of challenge or idea that uh, I want to pose to this entrepreneurial community here. Um, and just lastly, real quick, you know, like I said, I, I've been a part of a number of different entrepreneurial communities. And I think the ones that really do well are those who are constantly learning. I say to my team a lot that it's not about being right. Innovation is not about being right. It's about learning and catalyzing. And so if we can continue to learn together and share like Silicon Valley does, where we're always sharing our, our not just the things that go well, but the things that don't go well, that's good for our, our community. If we're catalyzing through pilots in a test market we have right here, that's great. And then humility, having a good amount of humility. Watching other cities like New Orleans and Atlanta, um, as well as Denver, they didn't just rest on their laurels and say, we're all friends, we're doing great. They kept asking themselves, like, how are we special? What's our secret sauce? They asked people that came through their doors, like myself and others that would come to different events. They would say, like, what do you think makes us interesting or kind of test it against um, the, that flow of global innovators that were coming through their community. So I would challenge you all to keep your ears and eyes open to those visitors. And one thing we're doing at the Global Innovation Center is we want to be the best front door for startups in VSP and in Sacramento. And so we're going to be those eyes and ears on behalf of our entire community to hear what is it that's so special about the Sacramento entrepreneurial community. Love that. Uh, one, I like the the aggregator of opportunities. I think that that's a, um, a great saying. Um, and then I also couldn't agree market that or couldn't agree more that the Sacramento region is this valuable test market. Um, and really, you know, it's a great way to, you know, have your startup, but also it's an, an attractor that we can sell to um, startups that are looking for places to um you know, scale their ben ventures. Um, so I know we're a little bit over. I had a rapid qu uh, round of questions, 30 seconds. And if not, I will cut you off. I will mute you. Um, and this is, uh, I think Mariah and Anna will appreciate. This is probably the number two in me coming out. Um, but, you know, instead of asking for advice to finish off, um, just since you've shared so much experience and expertise with us, um, you know, what can we do as a community to support you in moving your ventures or your um, organizations forward? So we'll start with Anna. Yeah, I'd say the biggest thing, just getting involved. Um, as it relates to Spark, we are raising a seed round right now. So looking to get in contact with any VCs in the HR innovation space. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. We'll go Arlen. Okay, uh, two things. One, uh, help us by promoting the CMC to your um, list of folks that you work with. And then secondly, remember that the, uh, that the companies we're gonna be working with, the most powerful way to help them be successful is through purchasing their products. So the city, the county, the large businesses should absolutely be investing in these companies from a uh, purchase standpoint of their, of their products and services. Thank you, Arlen. All righty, Mariah. 
Right. So um, continue to support Sacramento founders and, and to, to help them shine beyond. Um, for me personally, uh, going to Tech Funding Equity and checking out what we're doing to work there and subscribing. Um, also for accredited investors who are interested in our thesis, absolutely reach out to me at mariahdiversityv.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn and very open to continuing to connect and support uh, founders in this region and beyond. Next, we got Matthew. Um, personally, for the company, uh, we are rounding our closing out our, our round. So, if there are any investors that want to join our, our seed round, uh, just reach out to uh, contact at Joppa One. But more importantly, I want to say, uh, you know, we have a ton of support from the community. I, I think what I would want to ask is for everyone just to keep innovating and not stop being fearless or be risky. Go take your risks and don't be scared to fail. That, that's what I all I ask. Love it. And wrapping us up, we have Ruth. Yeah, I love that, Matthew. I think if you raise the bar um, within your pocket of greatness and your community, then it raises the bar all across. And then personally, if you see a role for the VSP Global Innovation Center um, and have ideas, I'm having to kind of equate myself in this very interesting time. So appreciate just any um, outreach and ideas. And then finally, check out our futures report. You can read about the, the problems we're looking to solve and the challenges that we have in our industry. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for sharing your amazing um, experience in the entrepreneurial ecosystem and your expertise. Um, and then also love you sharing your ass so we can support you and um, you know continue to foster our Sacramento startup community and entrepreneurial ecosystem. Thank you all for hopping on this evening for the uh, entrepreneurial state of the union to launch us officially into um, Global Entrepreneurship Week Sacramento. We have a ton of events left for this week. This is only day one. So we got four more days. And I think we have uh, close to 15 events still to go. So we're looking forward to having you plug in. Um, definitely check out our website. You can just uh, Google Global Entrepreneurship Week SAC, and it should be the first one that pops up. So definitely come check us out tomorrow that we have uh, five events lined up from uh, multiple ones with the colleges. We have three different events with the colleges. And then we also will be capping off with um, the Startup Sack and Carlson Center Happy Hour with Christopher Johnson. So thank you all for being here and for the wonderful conversation and look forward to the future of Sacramento. I think we do uh, have a great opportunity ahead of us. And I think just continuing to work together and um, all the stakeholders really getting behind the Sacramento region and promoting it. I think we are uh, destined for greatness. So appreciate all of you and we will call it to a close and have a wonderful rest of your week.